Let's bow in prayer, please. Thanks be to you, Almighty God, for your word of truth and life, your word of hope and mercy, your word of encouragement, your word of direction and correction, your word of forgiveness and salvation. Teach us, we pray. Deepen our faith in you, our trust in you, our love for you. Take us where you will, dear God, please that we would be better servants of yours with the time we have left on this earth. We humbly pray this in the glorious name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I am no master gardener by thought. I wouldn't even consider myself a gardener. I try at it sometimes. But uh, I'm not that great at it. This is what I've been told about rose bushes. I've been told that a rose bush left to itself will get all straggly and twisted and tangled and will actually grow in on itself. In fact, if left to this condition, I have been told that it will quite literally grow in the way of its own life. Therefore, it needs help in order for it to grow in the right direction, the healthy direction, the proper direction for a rose to grow. You see, left to its own devices, it will become nothing more than a jungle bunch or bushel of thorns. So what has to happen is a gardener has to cut off the parts of the plant that are growing inwards and getting all tangled up. Now this encourages the shoots to grow outwards toward the what? The sun, right? It's not blocking the light. It's not blocking its own light. It's growing towards the sun. Do you see the Christian parallel? <clears throat> Not the S-U-N for us Christians, we Christians, but the S-O-N. The same thing happens in our own lives as believers in Jesus Christ. And that brings us to our text for today. In our text for this morning, Jesus speaks about the importance, the, the vital nature of being connected to Him, to being connected to Him. And He uses this wonderful image of the vine and the branches. The vine produces the life necessary for the branches to produce what the vine, the branches are, are supposed to produce, and that is fruit. Fruit tree, right? Vine. Fruit. Jesus Christ says that he is the true vine. There are a lot of vines out there, brothers and sisters. But they're all fake. They're all phony. They're all lies. Jesus Christ alone is the true vine. Don't miss that word, please. God the Father is the gardener. And we who are true believers, I mean real Christians now, don't just wear the clothes of Christianity. We, real Christians, are the branches. Now, as branches connected to Christ, we are spiritually alive. Yet, we can only grow in the right direction. And what is the right direction? The direction God Almighty has for us. And how do we know that? We know that through His Word, right here. Correct? We can only grow in the right direction and bear the fruit we were created to bear if we remain connected to Him in the true vine. The true vine. You see, without being connected to Jesus Christ, the Savior and Lord, we are spiritually dead. Oh, it may look different to the world. We're dead and worth nothing. Worth more, no more than, than dead rotten wood whose only purpose is to be burned up. In John chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, Jesus tells us, quote, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off, he cuts off now, every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes 
so that it will be even more fruitful. Now here Jesus says that God himself literally cuts off from the vine all the branches that are useless to the vine. What do branches that are useless to the vine do to the vine and the branches? They suck off energy, right? They don't produce anything, correct? Notice here, God doesn't wait for those branches to get so rotten they fall off. He takes the initiative to cut them off. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit. I'm looking at a lot of people here this morning who bear a whole lot of fruit for God. You know something? God has pruned you and God continues to prune you just as he does me. No matter how many, no matter how much we bear, because we always can do more for God. God has more for us to do for him. Now, why does he why does he do that? Why does he prune, prune the branches that do bear fruit? To ensure that those branches bear more fruit in the future. So, in order to do what it was created to do, in order to reach its full potential, the branch must be pruned by the gardener. Now, my own experience with pruning comes from pruning bushes around our house and we have some small trees. They don't grow very tall, but they too need to be pruned. And I've learned the hard way that you need to be careful when you prune, don't you? I mean, I have one of those electric chainsaws. I just don't go out there with electric chainsaw. You know, and just, hey, hey, do your best. Hope you're better by, you know, next year at this time. No. What would that do? They kill the thing, right? <clears throat> Take time, I do, to carefully look at what I'm doing as to not cut too many away. I also take time to find those suckers. You all know what a sucker is, right? A sucker is a very small branch. It doesn't bloom, it doesn't blossom, it doesn't have any leaves on it, it doesn't grow any fruit. It just kind of sticks out. And normally it grows between the branches, which, if left alone, will sap the resources from the fruit-producing branch, correct? So to have a flower-filled plant and a better crop of fruit, I need to be careful what I prune and how much I prune. And also, I need to be sure I remove all those suckers. Now, what I'm about to share with you may make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. But my job is not to make you feel comfortable. My job is to tell you the truth from God's Word. There are a lot of suckers in the Christian church these days. I don't know of any in this church, but in the church in general, there are a lot of suckers. There are people who go to church to be entertained. They're the people who go to church to always get something out of it and never put anything into it. <coughs> They're the people who, who go to church not to worship God. They, see, they want to be seen. They want to show off their latest suit, dress, or whatever it is. They, oh, they want all the blessings and benefits that the church has to offer them. The pastoral care and, and all the rest. All the rest of it. They, they want it all. They want the fellowship, pastoral care. They, they want, oh yeah, they want it all. But don't ask them to give anything back. Don't do that. Because if you do, you know what they're going to do? They're going to say, I knew this church was all about money. That's what they're all about. And then you know what they'll do? They'll leave and go to another church and suck off of that church. And while they're there, they'll spread rumors about the one they just left. These people are the suckers. And it is better for the 
body of Jesus Christ, if at this stage in their lives they remain, would they not be a part of it? Because they don't do anything but damage the church. Don't offer anything to God. All they do is suck the life out of the body. Now let's be clear, brothers and sisters, when God prunes us, He's not punishing us. We're bearing fruit for Him, and He still prunes us. Please understand that when God prunes us, He is not punishing us. Like pruning a plant makes it more productive and fruitful, God prunes us so that we can do the same. Here's the question, how does God prune us? He prunes us by trimming away our bad habits and our unchristian attitudes. He removes from us those things that hinder our productivity and witness for Him. You see, when we came to Christ, many of us bought, brought baggage from our own lives, from our own sinful lives, correct? The, the scriptures call it the life of the flesh. Sinful habits, bad attitudes, unchristian ways of thinking about others and ourselves. And, and the heavenly gardener went to work right away, cutting anything and everything that does not look like Christ. And you know something? He still does. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says this, And we all, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Holy Spirit. Now finally, we need to remember that God is pruning us to prepare us for heaven. Yes. Yes, He is. God is pruning us to prepare us for heaven. You see, while heaven is already being prepared for us right now, and that's John chapter 14, verse 2, we are being prepared for heaven. The pruning that God does in our lives is not just preparing us for the opportunities God will present to us while we're in this world in which He has given us. God is also preparing us for eternity with Him. Let me give you an example. True story. During the Great Depression, a Christian man lost his job, lost his savings, and lost his house. His grief was multiplied by the sudden death of his wife. The only thing this man had left in his life was his faith. And one day as he walked in, into town looking for work, he stopped to watch as men did stonework on a church building, and one of those men was skillfully chiseling a triangular piece of rock. Not seeing a spot where it would fit, the man asked the man who was chiseling, where are you going to put that? And the man who was chiseling the rock pointed toward the top of the building and said, you see that little opening up there at the top of the spire? That's where it's going. I'm shaping it down here so it will fit up there. Well, tears filled the man's eyes as he walked away thinking of the words, I'm shaping it down here so it will fit up there. And he found new meaning, he found new hope, he found new value in his very difficult life. And you know something? We can do. Brothers and sisters, sometimes God's pruning in our lives can be painful. But through it all, we must always remember that God loves each of us so much, He is shaping us down here so we will fit up there. Shaping us down here so that we will be created, we will be formed, and more so into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, in our passage this morning, Jesus uses the word remain. Think about this. He uses the word remain eight times in four verses. I'm going to ask you to do something with me right now. I'm going to ask you to say the word remain with me eight times. You ready? 
remain, 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 remain. Do you think Jesus is trying to get a particular point across? As I mentioned earlier, we all, know, we all know people who have not remained in the vine, don't we? Do you know the consequences to those people? Let me read them to you. Second Peter 2, verses 20 to 22. And Peter is talking to those who were once in the vine and have now got away from the vine. Listen to the consequences here. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit, and a sow that is washed goes back to wallowing in the mud. Dogs vomit? Wallowing in the mud with pigs? Oh, by the way, Peter was Hebrew. What did the Hebrews think about pigs? I don't want that. And I know you don't either. That's why we need to remain, remain, remain in the mind. Allow me to close with a true story. It's a story I shared a few years ago, but it's a story that's worth repeating. It's true. It's a story of a young Christian farmer, a young Christian farmer during the days of World War II. This young man was drafted to the army, and up to that point in his life, he had never been but a few miles from his house. He was very anxious about what awaited him in the army, as you can well imagine, but he took with him his Christian faith. And while he was in the army, he read his Bible every night, and then he knelt in prayer by his bedside before going to sleep. And for some reason, his Christian devotion infuriated the sergeant who was in charge of the young man's company. So the sergeant said things and did things to humiliate this young man almost every time he got the chance. But through it all, the young man didn't respond. Yes, because you don't respond to a person who's in a higher command like that. But more so because of his Christian faith. Then late one Saturday night, the sergeant walked through the barracks, and he was half drunk. And he exploded when he saw the young man kneeling in prayer. He made fun of the young man in front of all the other soldiers, and he tried everything he could to embarrass this fellow. But when nothing he tried succeeded, you know what he did? He got even more angry, and he took off one of his heavy boots. This boot was caked with mud. And he threw it at that young Christian soldier, and he hit him in the back of the head, knocking him to the ground, and blood began to flow out of the back of his head. Yet the young man regained his composure, but without saying a word, resumed praying. Well, that made the sergeant even more angry. And so he took off his other boot and threw that as hard as he could at the young man, hitting him once again in the back of the head, causing even more blood to flow. But still the young man refused to respond. And in complete disgust, the sergeant cursed him out as he stumbled into his room and went to sleep. And the next morning when the sergeant woke up, he began to rub his eyes and shake off his hangover. And as he started to get out of bed, the first thing he saw were his boots. They were cleaned and polished and sitting neatly underneath his blood, courtesy of the young Christian farmer. Well, this was more than the sergeant could take. And, and so he walked into the barracks and he found the young man and he shouted, What is it with you? What is it with you? What? 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 I have 
have done everything in my power to hurt you, to offend you, to break you, to humiliate you. And all you do is take it. What is it with you? And the young Christian replied, Jesus, sir. Jesus is with me. That young man was connected to the vine, wasn't he? We know that because of the fruit he was able to bear, even in the most difficult of circumstances even in the face of suffering. You see, only by remaining connected to his Savior was he able to bear his Savior's image. That's our story. May we too bear such fruit for our Master for our Lord, God the Father, as he prunes us and as we remain in the mind. God be the glory.